Dawn, that's right, yeah. from the Los Angeles Blade yeah. and watching yeah. the Blade. Right. Thank you, Jess. Jess, why is it important that Star Trek, even if it's not Strange New Worlds, it's that Star Trek overall yeah. is representing queer people and being honored tonight? Why is that important? I think that Star Trek has always had such a powerful cultural influence. Uh, it is so widely watched by so many different types of people, so many people with different political beliefs, and they've always they've always spread like a fierce message of diversity and accessibility and acceptance and celebration of diversity. And I think that is so powerful. The fact that they they speak to so many different communities that they can really change the minds, you know. And at a time like this, when there is so much violence and separation and um, polarization and discrimination against members of the queer community, I think that Star Trek has a responsibility to stand behind our queer friends and um, make their position known. When I classify you, I hate labels, but are you queer adjacent? Are you an ally? What do you feel like, what's the right word for you? I'm queer. There you go! Yeah. You know, my BFF is a trans lesbian. Yeah. And she asked me to tell you she adores you. <laughs> so Maya Monet, Gosh. Maya Monet loves you. And there you go. It's now wow. on tape. Oh, you made my day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jess. It's great talking to you. First of all, as a as a widow, my heart goes out to you. Thank you. Seven years for me. My goodness. And grief doesn't have, have an expiration date. Remember that. How do you take that kind of personal challenge? Oh, God bless. God Always. bless. Always. How do you take that personal challenge and translate it into your work? Because I think LGBTQ people are the most introspective people on the planet. We know ourselves, but you have to really plumb the depths of your grief and everything else that you go through to fulfill your character's challenges. How does that work for you? Oh my goodness. Um... And if you don't want to talk about it... No, no, absolutely. Thank you for the question. Anytime anybody brings up my grief, they're bringing up my Brian, they're bringing up what it means to be a widow. Um, and now that I am one, this was absolutely not the platform that I wanted to be on, but, um, like, you really go through life, you have to become almost, like, unbreakable, relentless, right? Which which I find tracks so much with, with me as a working actor, you know? And as somebody who's always been very confident in who I am, um, even if the world doesn't always understand what that is. And in the world of acting, I've always felt like, you know, how many times did I hear from casting directors are very specific, we don't know where to put you, and one day a role is going to come that's going to make sense. And I've always just, like you said, it's, 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 a, it's a beautiful thing to be introspective, right? Because you get to think so much about yourself and who you are and how you present yourself to the world, and you get to ask yourself, you know, is this who I am? Am I not being truthful to myself? And how do I be more truthful in, in, in how I express myself? And so that's been my life, right? And as a working actor, um, and living in a in a in a in an industry where you know so often we kind of uh, you know auditions don't come often to someone who doesn't kind of look, like, mold, look, yeah. look, look like what everybody wants X Y Z A B C to look like. I know that feeling. Right, and so. So as I've been as I've been understanding grief and going through it, and every single day, like you said, there is no there is no end point. Um, my Brian is with me 24/7, and season two, uh, I think it's important. And I want people to know this that it is it is the most difficult thing I've ever done. It was it was I started, we started filming two months. I started filming two months after um, after my Brian passed, and every single day on set, I had him telling me not fall apart, right? Which is what... Hold it together. Hold it together, which is what he helped me do to get to this point, to get to Star Trek. I, I read about how much he was influential in getting you this part I mean, and so then pairing we, you. Yeah, and when you guys see... so when, He was with me throughout all season one, he was with me throughout all season two. So when fans see season two, especially so many fans who have spoken to me about their grief, um, also new grief, yes. like, you know, they were, they were with people who were with them for season one and now are not for season two physically. Um, and so I want them to know what you're watching, um, and me as the actor performing, is somebody who is overcoming every single day. 
right, in order to deliver. Because I have a phenomenal cast, I have an amazing crew, um, and they deserve my absolute best. And I, I'm not often like, I'm not often like, oh wow, I'm so impressed with myself. But I'm like, I did it. Do you know what I mean? I did it. So every day, I went to set and I was like, I gotta pull it together. That's right. And I did. And that's that was what I just. I think that speaks to Star Trek. Right? It is, yeah. It's 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 we overcome adversity and it's, it's believing that you can do it and then doing it. What does it mean to have so many queer other actors and allies and I call them accomplices standing by you on that set? Oh Behind the scenes too. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So first of all, I'm so happy to have Jess and Celia here. Right. Who are just rock stars and I'm so happy that the world is getting to meet them. Um, but everybody on our cast is like, not only like beautiful people, but gorgeous inside and out and so talented. Um, and I feel... I feel safe and elevated and 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 uh, and challenged every day, yeah. right? Like I mean, yeah. I'm like I don't know if I'm. Like, is this a dream? Is this real? <laughs> Everyone's just been really. Is it just wonderful. fantasy? Yeah. Right? But but in season two is really. I mean, they were there in season one. We were together through through the pandemic, through everything. But in season two, everybody from the directors who you know were visiting us for for each episode they saw, everybody was like, whatever you need. If you need to, to come to my office to, to cry, to have a moment, to be, if you need something, anything, we're there for you. And just knowing that, makes it, it allows you to to create, to perform, to breathe. And so, not to bring it back to what no. we're doing here, but yeah. I'm going to bring it back to what no, we're doing No, bring it back, yeah. It's like, it's like when you are supported and when you know that you're being celebrated yes. and that people not only like believe in you but are going to fight for you, you suddenly can like... That's right. Do what you do best. Do you know what I mean? I do. Right? I do. I think we just came to this really beautiful realization. Big circle. Right? I saw the first six. Spectacular. Oh, I'm loving it. I can't wait. And I'm just so grateful for you representing oh, both goodness. your culture, our community, and women who do things. Yes. You yes. know? Who fly starships. Yes. Yes. I fly the ship. Right? I fly the ship. <laughs> Oh my goodness, I'm so happy you love, love what you've seen so far. Thank you, Alyssa. Even bigger things are coming. And I'm so happy I got to guess, <laughs> meet you in person. Yes. What do you think about tonight? Is it important that Star Trek be recognized and why? The, the, the queer community should understand that Star Trek has always been queer. Yeah. There's so many people who are like, oh, you're making Star Trek queer. Hello. Star Trek has always been queer. If anything, I think the older iterations of Trek are even more queer than the ones we have now, honestly, because of how the queer community found representation of themselves in Star Trek well before I was even born, well before Strange New Worlds, well before Discovery. But to have something so concretely and honestly and authentically queer within this globally beloved franchise, that's so important. I mean, it's a really beautiful sentiment to reflect on that Star Trek is putting an emphasis on making sure queer people exist in the future and not just the hard parts about being queer, not just the discrimination and the persecution and the marginalization. It's Joy, not all sadness, right? Believe it or not, it's not all sad and Discovery taking their opportunity and right. time to put it out on their platform and really just show Trekkies all of what the Trekkie community looks like, that that is very <laughs> I have badgered I have badgered Akiva, I have badgered Mike McGann, yeah. I badgered uh, my new friend Terry Metalis <laughs> and uh, he took me out to lunch in Hollywood for four hours and oh, talked to me all about stuff. And also of course um, uh, Kurtzman, Alex. Yeah. Please put a Star Trek character out there that's trans. Yeah. I mean, it would really mean a lot. But Jesse was great. Yeah. Jesse was fantastic. Jessie. Having Jesse was Phenomenal. just a great thing. Yeah. Tell me, tell me though, in my community especially, mm -hmm. black trans people have it so much harder than someone white like me. Yeah. What does it mean for viewers who are little boys and girls who are black, seeing a woman like you achieving and, and doing what Nichelle Nichols did, which is breaking barriers? I mean, it means a lot to me. It's, it's probably the, the, the number one reason why I do it. I grew up in a climate in which blackness and queerness were approached as two separate things wow. and not a, a, a moment of intersection, at least really? from my understanding of it. When I was a young kid, I just had no idea what I, I was feeling until I found the content and media that represented my community authentically. And I went on Tumblr and found what things meant. <laughs> and so... God bless the internet. God bless the internet. Um, <laughs> but to be a part of the representation that I was so hungry for as a kid, there doesn't, there isn't a, 
much better feeling than that. I, I, it means a lot to me to be able to represent young black queer people in any iteration. It's okay. I saw the first six episodes. Yeah. Without giving spoilers, because we're a week and a half away. Yeah. Oh what do you God, want? What do you want our readers to know about uh, Ahura's, Nyota's journey, about your journey throughout this season two? Um, I would say I would want them to know that she's a work in progress, that she is very fresh and raw, and she's she's growing and learning, and that's what I love about my iteration of her so much, is that she's not so concrete and, and set in, in stone yet, and she is just trying to make it day by day, and that is something that I think is so beautiful to see, because in Star Trek I feel like you have to be, big. not you have to be, but there is a stereotype of Trek media where everyone's very serious and very sure of themselves, and to play this beloved character in a very insecure place and still feel that support is so beautiful, because then you get to see people who are like, who also don't feel as though they've had it all together, Yes. see themselves in someone who they may have once thought had it all together. Your, your cast members have told me about how you bring your stage work to this show, yeah. and how you're classically trained, and how much of a difference it makes that you are there as their guiding light. Oh, that must mean a lot to you to have them supporting you like that. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, it's, it's wild to think that these people I've been working with and, and have been like bonding with and really looking up to, honestly. I mean, like half of them are feet taller than me, so I spent a lot of time literally looking up to them. But to hear that they have learned anything or, or, or been shepherded in any way by me it gives me goosebumps because it, 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 that, that means a lot. I mean, you're, you're, the fans are going to love you and Paul. You. They're going to love that episode. They're going to love the episode with, oh my God. Yeah. I don't want to spoil it. But as a character who comes back, that you got me crying. <laughs> well, I was crying too. We were crying together if it means anything. But I, All right. I, no spoilers. I won't but, spoil anything. Yeah. But, uh, yes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. because of it. Yeah. So I feel like I'm very proud of what we've accomplished as a whole. What does it mean that Michelle Paradise herself is gay, part of our community, and show running? What does that mean? Does that make a difference? Does it matter? No, it's a huge deal. There are not a lot of out queer show runners. There are not, like, there's, there's not a lot of us really high up where we need to be. So the fact that we had Michelle kind of like running the ship was a massive, massive deal. It makes a huge difference. We need to have queer people in positions of power in the industry, like all over the place. It's got to be that way because you know we can want to tell our stories as much as we want to. If there are not a few of us at the top, it might not happen. Um, and she was an incredible, incredible leader, still is. Can you tell me what uh, inspiration you got from your space dad, from Anthony, and from Wilson on the set as a person, as someone coming out? What did it mean to you personally and as an actor? I mean this like. Fully, I'm not exaggerating. I don't think I could have had better role models. I, I don't think there are better, there are two better role models in terms of coming out and starting that transition than these two people, especially in, in the world that we're in and in the industry that we're in. Um, they both carved out a space for themselves uh, at a really, really important period of time, and they are continuing to do that, and they have been fully transparent about who they are the entire time. Like, I could not have better people to look up to and, and, and go to for advice, which is exactly what I've done, and I've used a lot of their time, but like, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I got really lucky. Every time I see you in the red carpet, you're doing something else that's, wow, <laughs> wow, wow, wow. So tell me what this is. What is this, what is this we're looking at here? I don't know. <laughs> I just like, no, I like, I like mixing and matching. I really love like oversized stuff. And, yeah. Um, I love like the classic mask and gun and all. I don't know. Yeah. I love it. Love the legs, by the way. Oh, Thank man. You. And those shoes. Look at those shoes. Oh, man. Shoes. Kick ass. <laughs> Thank you. The last thing is, tonight is your night. Do you realize 
that if it, it wasn't for you, there are kids out there who would never see a trans non-binary actor on TV except for you. I mean, there's some. There's some. Yeah. But you stand out. I'm like starting to... It's been three years, but I feel like I'm starting to understand that more. I was just saying to somebody, like, when I started this, I didn't know, I didn't feel like I was doing enough. Oh, um, wow. And the longer I've been doing it, the more I've realized, like, oh, I didn't, I didn't start my transition until I saw somebody else on screen who was trans. We need to see ourselves reflected back to us. We're human beings, and that's, in, 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 we've made a society where TV and film is a huge part of it, and that's how we see ourselves. And if we're not there, we don't know that we're okay to be there and okay to exist. So that's like slowly settling in about how much this actually matters. <laughs> um, recognizing discovery because of your acting because of your character because of the other queer characters like blue and anthony's what does that mean to you personally i mean it means a lot but i also have to i have to recognize the fact that the reason why we're being honored tonight for our storyline is because star trek is a franchise that reaches around the globe it has the kind of reach that we hope our storyline um, is served by, right? The fact that this storyline has been so impactful around the world is because Star Trek has been so um, successful in helping people inspire, helping to inspire people to create a better world. And so the fact that LGBTIQ people are a part of the stories now um, is why we're here tonight. But it's not a better world. I gotta tell you, in oh. 10 years since I came out, I've never known a time that was as hard, my hand's getting tired, that was as hard as it is now. Oh. And I have a trans daughter now, so I'm scared. I really, literally am scared. My, my, you once said hello to my friend Maya Monet. She can't go to the bathroom in public. She can't get hormones because she lives in Florida. What's your message to them? You know, um, I was just saying, I'm reading this book called uh, The Deviant War by Eric Servini. I'm rereading it, I should say. Yeah. Which is about how the movement started here in the United States back in the 50s and 60s. And so, it's been really helpful to me to read this book now, because it's very easy to be disheartened by this moment in history. But when we remember the courage and the effort that it took to get us to this moment, we can't help but be inspired to continue their work. We have to take over for Frank Kameny, for Sylvia Rivera, for Marsha B. Johnson, for all of those people back in 1969 who started our first Pride, who called it Pride so that we would stop being ashamed of who we are, we have to remember that that work led us to this moment and it felt great to get the kind of uh, result that we've had in the last 20 years, but that didn't mean that the work was done. We expected this backlash. Yeah. We knew this was going to happen. Yeah. So now we have to do the work of supporting all of those people who are doing the kind of work like Outright International that helps us to maintain the rights that we have and to spread them around the globe. I don't want people to be disheartened. I want people to be encouraged by the fact that we get the opportunity to continue to do the work that Frank Hammond and Sylvia Rivera and Marshall and Johnson start. One last question about Anthony and about... Yeah. Seasons of Love and about Without You. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about why you're doing this thing Thursday night and what it means to you. Well, I'm doing it first and foremost because Anthony's show is gorgeous. I mean, Mary Weissman and I went to see it together <laughs> and we were expecting to see it and love it. We were not expecting to be uh, in a bucket of our own tears by the end of it. Same. It's so incredibly moving. He's so spectacular in it. And so I'm doing this talk back because he wants to do it and I'll do anything for Anthony Rapp. He's my space boot, but, and I'm excited to do it. Um, but I can't wait to see the show again. Yeah, me too.
that's how it was that's advertised. That's why we were in the middle. <laughs> sure, okay, cool. This is Blue Wilson, and we're going we're gonna to share a bunch of fun. Is this on? Okay, yeah. Hi. Um, we're going to share microphones. Because we have two microphones for three oh, people. So no, 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 it's fine. I'm okay. just saying, that's the process. I know it's moderating. Hi. Um, I don't know how you did that. suffering with all of this smoke in the air right now um, from, from these fires in Canada. I'm going to send all my love to Canada. Um, you're welcome. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, was, I, tw I, I sent out a message yesterday. I was like, you know, keep in mind that it's hard enough to breathe in all of this, this air right now, let alone have to sing, you know, and you're, you know, giving us everything, your grief, your heart, and your voice, then is it, was it hard tonight? Um, actually, you might notice we're in a basement. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but still, you're in the no, world no, today. Yeah, yeah, well, we, we're, I'm staying indoors and, and then masking when I'm going outside, so I'm just trying to be careful. You're yeah, always good about that. Yeah. Well, they can do a closed ventilation thing in here, apparently, where they're not bring, bringing air from the outside. I guess they didn't at first yesterday, when they did. But we have it down all the way down here in the lower level. <laughs> Okay, knock on one, but um, yeah. I do notice like when I walk and walk around my uh, my contact, like that's where I feel it. Yeah, for sure. I mean I felt it. I was I sounded like Harvey Firestein <laughs> most of the time. That's just a Tuesday for you. That's true, that's true, that's true. How are you doing, Blue? Uh. <laughs> Blue's Blue's voice is very low. They're enjoying it very much. Yeah. No, this is okay, I love you so much. You said come here and then you come on stage and then and then this and I knew what it was too, but like also my mom's here. So I don't know. Oh, hi, dude. Like, I'm like already an anxious person and then after this I'm like, this was unkind to ask. Like, this is rude. So very rude. You're welcome. I'm so I don't I don't know, it just like it you you already know this, and I've told both of you, and you can't be mad at me, but I've watched like bootlegs of the, the, the original performance because I like, wasn't born yet. So we're gonna get Very, I mean, this is the thing about Anthony, he's very um, steadfast and he's, 
like he, you, you know, you, 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 it's one of those people who you like you shove him and he doesn't, he just kind of at work, <laughs> at work, no, I'm serious, I'm serious. That's a big, just seriously. In, in like family life, sometimes with my crazy extended family, you could shove me out and be like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> but, even, but even as you know, as a friend, I, you know, if ever I have an issue or something, I always feel like I can go to you and I get, you know, um, a, 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 a calming feeling from you, and so I'm sure, you know, Rai is going to um, benefit from that. Both of you guys are. Thank you. Ken is me. So congratulations. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know where to begin. I don't know where to begin. Um, uh, you know, I'll start here, since we're all on stage. Um, you know, this coming season uh, of Star Trek Discovery, which will start streaming in 2024, is our last season. Um, and it's been a, a really amazing, um, it, it's been quite a journey. I mean, it's a show that has evolved and changed and um, we've all grown, I, I feel, those characters have grown, we've grown into them, I think as actors we've grown. What has that experience been for you? Well, listen. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, it, it, in real, in a real sense, I first of all never imagined I'd ever be in a show like Star Trek because I, I'd been like a fan of those kind of shows, and I thought, oh, I'll just be a fan of those kind of shows, and I'll do like other weird little things, and not that. So then to be in it in the first place was already life changing. But then to get to do groundbreaking storytelling and to get to create ultimately, well, first just by having a queer couple on the screen in Star Trek. to be able to break that glass ceiling, which, you know, was 50 years too late, really, in some ways they tried to do it before, but they hadn't. Um, and then, not knowing that I'd get to be this dad that we talked about, create this queer family, and to get to represent and talk about trans and non-binary issues in the way that, you know, I remember I remember when we first got cast, um, thinking, starting to think, and I think we even talked about it among our cast, like first to second season, like, like having trans yeah, just like, what would it be like in the future with trans people? Like, what are the conversations gonna be like? And how would we have that conversation yeah. Yeah. about it on the show, yeah. yeah. And then lo and behold, um, along came this, this person <laughs> sitting across the stage from me. Um, and I was, you know, so it just, it, it just kept being the gift that kept on giving. Um, I think, what, so you know, I, it's also really interesting that um, you know, rent was the, was was so revolutionary because of the fact that it was so diverse in its casting um, at at that time, right? Um, it was a bit of an anomaly, um, and it also it's also what what people noticed about it was that it was a cast that looked like the world in which we live in. And it was before the phrase "representation matters." There was that was not something that was being talked about, and certainly not in the mainstream. And it was something that Michael Greif took very seriously. It wasn't necessarily Jonathan's initial vision of the cast of the show, for instance. In the in the 94 workshop, which I talk about a little bit in this version, Daphne was Latina and um, that was it for the Oh and and, and Colin and not uh, sorry and um, uh, the actor who, who played Benny in that production was black. But those out uh, of the eight principals, they were the only actors of color. Collins was a white dude. Um, oh I'm sorry, Joanne, sorry, pardon me. So there were three three out of the eight instead of what it became what five? So you know, um, even the, like in the in the, the the ensemble cast was also incredibly diverse. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that was that was a little even though even that though I think got a little, a little more right. Um, but my point is that you know uh, it's that's that's what uh, what attracted me to to Rent originally was that it looked like a show that I, that I could be in a uh, and and looked like people that I knew and that I looked like the world that I lived in. Um, and, and the same goes for Discovery, right? And, and Discovery was also, um, you know, notable for the fact that it had such a diverse cast at a time when we were having a conversation about diversity. Um, and that's also what attracted to me that, uh, to that show. And now we see that that is becoming the norm. Ish. Ish. Yeah. Right. Ish. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't have to take odd jobs anymore as, as often. Um, but um, but can you? Talk, I'm, I'm talk to you because you. Because you, <laughs> Boom. Well, because you, as you continuously remind us, were born in 1997. <laughs> <laughs> so 
so it's like not their fault. <laughs> they give me shit about it. I don't want to give them as much shit about it. Uh, so, you know, was it, it was is was is it was as big of a deal for you as it as it was for us to be on a show that was as, as diverse as that is? Yeah, well I this is why I, I say constantly that I don't think I could have possibly had like better mentors and people for this because I feel like we're, I mean, if you look at the kind of stuff that's happening in protests like against trans people, the posters that are written now versus the ones that were written about gay people, is the same thing. It's the same exact thing. Like this is, you know, getting our children, all this stuff, it's the same stuff. I feel like trans people are going through a similar fight that you both literally went through and I have the teachers for it. Cause I like, I, I don't think I would have been able to do this show without both of you, and I don't. I was like at the start of my transition. They literally just got out of college. Yeah, I just got out of college. Um, was I just was really, really struggling, and I don't. And you both took me in like immediately, and you, you took me out to lunch, and you both like it. Just I needed both of you because yeah, you I you both done it. You've done it, and you're still doing it, <laughs> completely transparently and honestly the entire time. Um, and Ian as well, who had already been doing it since he was younger. Like it, I, I needed, I needed you guys, um, and I do think it's the same, if not very similar. Um, it's really scary, especially right now. Appreciate that. We said we, I mean, we've said this to each other, and I think to you and Ian as well. Like we feel like we're standing on your shoulders and your generation's shoulders because your generation is like taking it to the next level of insisting from day one to your families, to your schools, to your peers to be seen as you are. You know. We also saw ourselves and our own experiences in them, right? Like we understood what it was to be a young person in this industry. And when they brought you onto the show, we were like, okay, we have to protect this person, make sure that their experience is a good one and that it's a nurturing space for them. And I think we, we made a conscious effort to make sure that both Ian and Blue were taken care of. But they didn't need to be taken care of right. because yeah. they came in, I'm not kidding. But, well, they both came in and 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 not to, not didn't make demands so much as they were like um, things here be, could be better and different, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, mainly uh, Ian, which is great because Ian was like a little baby. Ian was three years younger than me, which is two when we started, and Ian was the first one to be like, "This is wrong. This needs to be changed. <laughs> we need to bring someone in here to talk about pronouns and everything." Like Ian was very quick on the draw, um, but. Yeah, it was. It, I think things got done because we had your support. Yeah. Um, we had the entire cast support, and we needed that because we were new. And yeah, it. it I, I feel like we're. I you're saying this about gamer generation. We're only able to do this because of like, what you guys did. This is. I, we wouldn't be able to have this much leeway, this much push, and this much like community of doing what we're doing, and knowing that when one of us needs to stand up and say something, we're going to be backed up mm -hmm. usually. Right. I'm, I remember at one point there we were having a conversation, you know, we were at lunch or something, and and you were like, well, I think you and Ian were saying, oh, you know, this is this is a problem, this one, and and I think we encouraged you, we're like, well, then you should say something about it, right? I think you thought we were going to say something about it, or you were going to tell us that what was wrong, and I was like, oh no no, <laughs> no no, you can do this. You can say that and have that conversation, and we will support you in it. And that's how changes, how change happens, right? Um, but we we couldn't be your voice. We wanted to give you permission to use yours. I needed for sure. Right. That I, I did not. I was like at the point because it was the first like big job I had. It was truly like if you spit on my face, I'll say sorry. Like I didn't. I, didn't, so I needed that from you guys, and it probably wouldn't have happened as quickly if we didn't get it. So thank you. Awesome. Um, yeah. I'm not sure. It's 8.15. Should we, should we open some yes. questions? Yes. Oh, yeah. They are far more interesting. Sure. sure. It's, it's, I mean, I don't know if I have questions. Can I be the Oprah? <laughs> <laughs> How do you do it? <laughs> <laughs> and you'll get a car. And you'll get a car. <laughs>
who were your mentors and heroes in extraordinary? Um, and yeah, so in terms of the in the in this particular subject that we're talking about, um, I had the incredible privilege and honor of meeting and working with Larry Kramer. Um, wow. When I was around, I was trying to remember how old I was exactly. In my early twenties, um, I did a reading of the play he wrote called *The Destiny of Me*. And so I didn't get to work with them extensively or for a long time, but just even that short process. When, we, when we say a reading, it's usually just a few days of like getting together and working on a little bit. It's not like a full process. But even in that time, just to be around him, um, it was a galvanizing experience. And he really availed himself to answer all any questions I had. He talked so openly. It was an autobiographical play. I knew, um, uh, um, oh my God, what, what's wrong with my brain? Tired. No, they're playing another play. No, normal heart. So, um, you know, just being being in his presence, it was like he was like this thing that I'm talking about with Blue, where he did this before other people were doing it. Or among, there were few people, but very few people who were saying, "Hello, we just, we need to be seen and heard." You know, I understand now, and there are also things that he was aware of that were problematic. So I wasn't as aware of privy to some of the things and some of the complexities that were happening in the movement, but um, just in terms of being somebody who demanded that queer people and people with AIDS and HIV were at, at, at minimum seen and heard, let alone treated with respect, let alone helped, um, was electrifying. And that, that conversations, that those conversations I had with him were exactly why I then came out publicly. And it was in a very small way, I, it was in, the, in his production of in the Destiny of Me, I, got, I actually got to replace John Cameron Mitchell in it. And I was only in it for a week, because we had, there was a blizzard, and then 14 people were in the audience, and they had to close the show. <laughs> <laughs> but in my bio, I thanked my then boyfriend, and that was how I did it. Well, it was a small way, but it was, you know, once you're out, you're never in again. But it was because of that. Um, so, so that's the person. You know, it's very great. Um, for me, you know, it, that's a difficult question for me to ask because I was 19 years old uh, when I came out uh, to my parents, and then when I came out publicly while I was doing my so called life. And, uh, um, so, but there, there was Harvey Firestein, who, yeah. who I didn't know personally, but who I, who I knew existed and whose work I, I loved. And um, I remember watching a Chor Song trilogy when I was teenager uh, on HBO, because uh, we can afford to go to the movies, and um, there's a speech that he gives uh, when he's speaking to his mother, and he, sa you know, he says to her, um, I taught myself how to cook, I taught myself how to sew, I taught myself how to do all of these things because I prepared myself for the day when you would reject me, basically, mm -hmm. in, in so many words. And I understood that. And in that moment, I felt very seen because I understood it as a teenager that I was doing the same thing, that I was becoming um, as self-reliant as I possibly could because I was preparing myself for the worst. Um, but when I finally did my soap opera, there was a, a producer, a line producer, his name was Alan Poole, who went on to produce little shows like Six Feet Under and Rome. And, you know, <laughs> no, no big deal. Uh, but he was a, 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 a member of GLAD's board at the time. And he was openly gay, he was our producer. And when I, when I decided I wanted to come out publicly, I didn't have a publicist like I do now. I didn't have, hey. uh, <laughs> uh, and I didn't know, I knew that I wanted to do it, and I knew there was a conversation that I was ready to have. I don't know how I knew that at 19. Uh, so I went to him, and I said, how do I do this? We were on set, we were on set one day. I went to his office, and he said, go back to set, and, um, and I'll, I'll get back to you. And he called up the advocate himself, and he said, I have a young actor on here who wants to come out. And they came to my apartment and did a whole interview with me, and I, that's how I came out in the advocate. Um, and he set it all up. Wow. Um, it was a terrible picture of me. <laughs> it's very weird. Um, but that, that was it. And so, uh, you know, um, I talked about the, the other day, you know, I had to be my own hero. But I also understood that I was living in a moment and a time that was ready for it. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I knew that, but I knew that I was ready to do it and that we were ready to have that conversation. And I knew that the show that I was doing at the time was going to help that conversation happen. Mm -hmm. And that I needed to be someone 
who not only was playing that character, but that I had to be an actor who was saying, hey, I stand behind this, and this is real, and this happened to me, and it's happen happening to kids all over the country. And so when you talk about um, that we've been through this before in terms of you know how gay people were treated and now how trans people are treated, there's a documentary right now everyone should watch called it, it's by uh, it's about Judy Bloom. Mm -hmm. And Judy yeah. Bloom was amazing. It was so Amazing, and she talks about the fact, and it reminded me that in the '80s, during the Reagan years, um, there was a there was a book ban then, yep. and it was all about, you know, you know, anti-feminist, anti-gay. You know, it was all of the same subjects that we are dealing with now that people are trying to ban books on. We've been through this before, mm -hmm. and now we're going through it with young people whose books were banned. Right? These are the people who were, whose books were banned are now banning books. <laughs> so it's taught. This, this is taught. Intolerance is, is taught. Um, so we've been through this before, but we've also won this battle before. Yes. Which is how I know yes. we win this battle again. Yes. Um, well, let's go to the journalists. <laughs> Hi, Wilson. Hi, Congratulations on the Outright Award to all of y'all. Happy Pride Month. Would each of you tell us how you're celebrating Pride and what your message is to those towns that are refusing to raise Pride flags and not have Pride celebrations anymore? What? Yeah, Weathersfield, Connecticut. They decided no Pride. Well, I mean, let's be, let's be clear about what Orlando, right? Right. There are places in the country that it's now become uh, uh, uncomfortable for the LGBTQ community to have their celebrations in their towns because of a very small minority of people um, who are very loud. Um, and so in order to safeguard the LGBT community in some of these places, the community has decided that it's best for them to do smaller celebrations, or not to do them at all. Um, so my message to them is, hey, um, pride is not a parade. Pride is a protest. Pride has always been a protest. It began as a protest. Frank Kameny, Sylvia Rivera, Marsha P. Johnson, Woo! these people helped us create pride because we were a community that was that was taught shame. So the reason why it's called pride is because these people who started this movement understood that we had to let go of our shame that was taught to us and embrace our community and be proud of who we are in order to teach another generation that they could do better, that it would get better. So as difficult as it is in this moment to have pride in some of these communities, we need pride in those communities more than ever. And sometimes we have to face our fear in the face, right in the mirror. We have to look at it. We have to steady ourselves. We have to arm ourselves and hold on to each other. And that's what pride is, right? Pride is an, is a, is an opportunity to be a community and as a community say, we are not going to be erased and silenced and shamed back into the closet again. It's not going to happen. It's not. I understand the need to be safe, but there's also the need to be proud mm -hmm. in this moment and not let fear win out. That's not who we are. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I would echo those sentiments in terms of that part of it, for, in terms of celebrating Pride. Um, you know, it's a different way. Of, I'm not going to be in New York for Pride itself here in New York um, because we are taking rides to meet Ken's family in California. They've already yeah. had their Pride celebration, yes, but did. that is a very um, proud thing that we are doing. We are having our queer family okay. fully embraced in the fullness of his entire family. Um, 
um, and our extended family who lives out there. So, um, and we're having, on the day of New York Pride, we will actually be having a Trek family gathering also in LA with our Trek family. Thank you, Anthony. That's, 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 that's pretty cool. Yeah. Blue? Oh, yeah. Same yeah. question. What are you doing um, for Pride? I am um, here. A lot, of my, <laughs> a lot of my Pride Month was planning on coming here and seeing your show. That was like a huge thing for me this month because I, I knew it was going to be really important for me and that was like been waiting since it opened. Um, and um, just being with my friends, I think. I'm trying to, there was a, well, you were saying this stuff about like like smaller areas of town, but there was a school in LA in Glendale that like oh, two right. days ago had a massive protest where a bunch of like, got yeah, it got really violent. Um, kids, for, about like kids, the parents were upset they were being taught about, uh, yeah, LGBT plus history in LA. Um, and what I'm trying to do is I know it's annoying and it's not always the best place or healthiest place to be or like put yourself into, but like social media right now is kind of the only place where, because kids are loud and the kids right now are the people that everybody should be following because they really don't get like at all, they don't care. <laughs> I don't know where that's coming from. Of like, there's not even a, a moment of thinking about like, is this too much? It's just, <laughs> we're done. <laughs> it's, just, it's just stupid and ridiculous. But that's where the first information is coming from. Of like, hey, that's where I heard about this school and this protest that was happening. It was just a kid on there saying like, hey, there's a bunch of parents coming to our school to protest this. Like, please show up. And people did show up. And that's where we need to be because I'm not seeing this stuff anywhere else because people don't want to talk about it. Um, but it's scary and it's important. And so I'm kind of immersing myself into that even though the other side of it can be really ugly and people saying really terrible things to us. But like. It's necessary, it's needed, it's a, it's a good evil. Um, yeah. I'm going to be here in New York for Pride. I'm probably going to be marching with Outright International. And, um, and I'm um, just between you and the 30 people in here, I'm taking over as the chair of the board of GLSEN. Um, All right! Wow. Listen to the gay, gay is it still called the Gay Lesbians Trade Educators Network? Yeah. It, that's, it, it's going to be an, an acronym pretty soon. Okay. But yes, it is the Gay Lesbians Trade Educators Network right now. It's basically an uh, organization that um, works around the country to make sure that every school in this country is a safe place for queer kids. Congratulations. <laughs> what was it like to feel the weight of the Star Trek universe on your shoulders? Yes. Um, but here's a weird thing. To, I, I don't know if this was true for you, but my first day of doing anything was actually not even, I didn't even get to do a scene. We did like a promo photo shoot first. So before I get to even really play my character, I'm in the uniform with the haircut, and I'm handed a phaser, <laughs> and I'm handed a, 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 a tricorder, and I'm like, <gasps> Action figures as a kid, like I had that stuff. Like I watched the, I watched Leonard Nimoy when I was, I don't know, eight, nine, ten years old after school. Like, and here I was. Hey! <laughs> That's the first Your geek brain exploded. Um, I know my first, my first day was on set, and I was with, I was with you. What was the first scene? You know, I so it wasn't. So what's funny is I did episode five. These, the, the, my character is revealed in episode four, and, but we make we shot episode five first. My scene's in episode five, and then we went back and did my scene in four. Anyway, uh, and it was a scene in which I, <laughs> you and I are in the turbo lift. The doors open to the bridge, and I have to walk out onto the bridge and we're angry with Saru. Right? Like I'm like I, I end up playing like this guy who leads with his heart, right? But I end up being very pissed off because we're we're um, abusing the tardigrade. Right. Right. And so you and I get in an argument about we have we, we see it differently. Um, but all I can remember is that I walk out onto the bridge. So I'm like 
oh my God. Like, <laughs> and our bridge was, is huge and it's beautiful. And I was just like, I couldn't just be like in my, my med lab, like just dealing with like a patient or something really easy, you know? So instead I'm like arguing with you and Saru, who I, I've never, I hadn't seen him in costume yet. And he's like this gigantic guy, he's all prosthetics and he's waving his big ass fingers at me. <laughs> And I was just like, I, I now I actually watched that scene recently, and I was just like, I'm just saying words. <laughs> <laughs> our, our lives are weird. <laughs> are weird. We said that a lot, and a lot. I mean, through the five years, I don't know how many times I walked up to him and be like, we're on Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> That was, that was, it was when I first time but I think it was like the first day I was there for like hair and makeup. But somebody was walking around outside in a robe and a giant, giant alien head smoking a cigarette. And I, I just, that's always my like. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, fully in the robe, covering their face, smoking a cigarette. Best day of my life. Um, and, no, my first day was with. Uh, it's also so real. Bye. But you were there. And I thought you hated me. <laughs> didn't, didn't, didn't hate, didn't I know, hate. fully didn't hate, but it was the thing. I was very nervous, and you were very calm, and that, for to me, meant you hated me. <laughs> <laughs> it's such an, it is truly an object lesson in like the difference of experiences of internal and external. Right? Yeah, we're very excited to see. You. I know, no, but no, but it was. I just, I, don't, I, because I have very panic energy, and you have very like that's good. <laughs> so, so I was I was shadowing Jonathan Briggs. I mean, Jonathan Briggs is our director, and I was like shadowing him because I'm, I'm also an aspiring director, and he was like teaching me stuff. And so I was there, and and, 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 and Briggs was directing that episode, and so I was there, and we were like we were actually gleefully watching Blues work on the monitor, and like remarking to each other about how fucking great they were doing. And that's the energy. That, that, was, that, 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 was, that was the sweet bit. That was the no, because every time I would do a take and I was so nervous, I would kind of look and like you could see them at the end of the hallway because I could see where the monitor was, but it would just be both of them like. <laughs> and I, every time I looked, especially you, it would just be like. <laughs> it was so sweet. Anyway, yeah. yeah. Um, that was our last question, but I just I was told, right, Paul? Um, but I just wanted to say thank you. This is the second time I've seen the show, and I cried more the second time than I did the yes. first time. Oh, right. Yes! Oh, Yes! Yes! And the first time I was a mess, so I was even more of a mess this time. Any Wait, tears from you, Blue? Any tears? Yeah, I haven't <laughs> cried in like four months because of hormones. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for opening me up your and for breaking your heart open. Thank you so much.